It was a routine drive along a quiet road on the outskirts of the Iranian capital, Tehran. As usual, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh was traveling in convoy with his team of bodyguards. Why so many bodyguards? He was believed to be the most senior scientist behind a covert nuclear weapons program. What happened next is the subject of confusion and multiple conflicting accounts. No one disputes that Fakhrizadeh died that day, that he was shot at multiple times. But according to one account from senior Iranian officials, at the time of the ambush, no attackers were present. The shots came from a machine gun, hidden in a car, but no one was there to pull the trigger. The gun was automated, remote controlled, it was claimed. Another Iranian official said that the gun used artificial intelligence. Now this story is murky, but it touched a nerve. The story of the computerized machine gun that fired on its own sounded a lot like that frightening staple of dystopian movies, the killer robot. Something that can think, aim, and even take a shot all by itself. I'm Suzanne Kiampour, and on The Inquiry this week, we're asking, are killer robots the future of warfare? Part 1. Ghost in a Machine What we're really talking about are, are systems that have the ability to select and engage targets without the intervention of a human operator or without the direction of a human operator. Heather Roth is a senior research analyst at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in the United States. She's advised the U.S. Defense Department and given testimony to the U.N. When talking about robots in warfare, the word that experts use is autonomy. It means giving machines the power to make decisions on their own, without any kind of direction from humans. But this isn't a black and white issue. When we talk about autonomous weapons, there is a wide spectrum from basic examples to something that looks like Robocop or the Terminator. But we're not talking about the future. We have autonomous weapons already. We have, you know, a lot of our sea mines, several different kinds of land mines. Um, Cyber technology, cyber weapons have the ability to behave autonomously. Um, And then in the realm of of greater munitions, for instance, we have Israel's uh, Harrop and Harpy, which are anti-radiation missiles. Those systems can be launched and then they will find a signal and then decide, quote unquote, decide uh, to prosecute an attack on that signal. Um, You can put the Patriot missile battery, for instance, for air defenses on fully automatic mode, uh, given rules of engagement or, or particular threats. This might come as a surprise, but it just demonstrates that the idea of what makes a killer robot is not as clear-cut or futuristic as we might expect. Nevertheless, there is a whole range of advanced and slightly scary autonomous technologies in development around the world. With China, China is interested in bolstering its land forces, its its armies. You're going to see them expanding their blue water navy, so you could imagine having more autonomy on ships and submarines. For the Israelis, they are heavily focused on ground-based systems, so things like tanks and Humvees and artillery. Russia also is heavily investing in in these ground-based systems, so again, tanks and artillery, automated guns and turrets, things like this. The United States is interested in pretty much every single domain. Um, You're looking at the Air Force um, and air base systems, so missiles and planes. The UK is interested as well in in, uh, kind of bolstering autonomous capabilities within its Air Force and its Navy. You can have swarms of missiles, you can have swarms of smaller, you know, drones, you can have swarms of boats. The US Navy has demoed swarming boats, uh, unmanned swarming boats for ship defense. It's worth mentioning that not all of these weapons in development are meant to be killer robots, to be capable of deploying lethal force. Some of them are designed for reconnaissance or assistance, for example. But there are some serious weapons being developed out there, 
And Heather has some worries, especially when it comes to who's doing the developing. The Western countries tend to be very risk averse. They do extensive testing of their systems. Russia, however, has tended to innovate very quickly and then just deploy systems to the field to operationally test without doing a lot of kind of initial developmental testing uh, to see if the systems are safe. Um, so there's, there's a large kind of area that makes me queasy. And, you know, I think Russia's deployment of its forces and its near neighbors, um, its attitudes towards risk, its tendencies to automate ground vehicles and its tendency to go into civilian populations, um, that makes me makes me more more worried because deploying such systems in high risk environments and not having sufficiently or adequately tested them is a recipe for disaster. Part two, a philosophy of war. Our second expert has spent years thinking deeply about the effects of war. It's something he's seen up close. I spent five years with the British military as part of the Royal Marines, and uh, that experience has had quite a formative effect on me personally, and I suppose it's left me with a lifelong interest in questions at the overlap of technology and security. Tom Simpson is now Associate Professor of Philosophy and Public Policy at the University of Oxford. He makes the case for using robots to perform dangerous jobs that would otherwise be done by humans. There is a positive moral argument for them. By developing these systems, we can save people's lives. And for the government that is developing these systems, it's their own soldiers' lives, and they have a clear responsibility to do that, to develop technologies that will save their own soldiers' lives. But he also recognizes that there are risks in this technology. The danger that people are quite properly and rightly worried about is that the system will make wrong decisions. It will end up killing people who ought not to be killed. And as a human soldier, it's my responsibility to make the distinction between legitimate targets and those who are innocent. And the worry is that automated systems will not make that discrimination successfully. So then the question is, what is the acceptable level of risk? Some people will think that the acceptable level of risk is zero, so we shouldn't use a system that poses no risk whatsoever. And that's not my view. Um, So my view is that these systems should be used only if the level of risk that they pose to non-combatants is lower than that posed by an all-human military force. As we'll hear later, civilian casualties in ground combat situations are a major area of concern. But Tom thinks there are arenas of war where the risks are far more acceptable. So one would be air-to-air combat, and you can very easily see a scenario where you might have um, a human machine team, so a single fighter pilot in a fighter jet, maybe with 20 or 30, autonomous systems which are uh, in some sense linked to the plane but once the space the combat space which they're operating in has been defined so it might be a 30 square mile box there could be verification that there's no one other than enemy combatants in that space and you could see how autonomous systems could operate lethally in that environment but in a way that's very very safe for civilians because the point of fact is there are just no civilians there but more widely Tom thinks there is another moral and practical argument for developing autonomous weapons. Put quite simply, the genie is out of the bottle, and even if you don't develop these weapons, your enemies will. The question that has to be confronted for the advocate of a ban, the advocate of a voluntary self-restraint, is how will we live ourselves if in 20 years there is an adversary nation which does have these systems, and our armed forces are completely incapable of defending ourselves against that. And that, that seems to me to be a situation where a population would turn around to their government and say, that was a bad decision. The first duty of the government is to provide for the security of the country. Responsible governments should adopt a, a no first use policy where we commit in advance to, uh, to, to not using these systems. But that allows that we might seek to develop them for primarily for defensive purposes. 
It's a tactic that might remind you of the nuclear arms races of the mid 20th century. Although it does raise the question, for killer robots, why would you need to build the same weapon to counter the threat? Take a system where you have some kind of form of nanotechnology or microtechnology, which is deploying uh, 20,000, 50,000 objects over, over an area. There's no way that individual humans or even a team of humans are going to be able to operate quickly enough to counteract this. So you may not need an identical system to combat that, but you'll need some kind of automated system that is capable of using some form of force in order to deal with the sheer complexity of the threat that you're facing at that point. So should we develop the technology and just see what our scientists and engineers can produce? Part 3. Rage Against the Machine I think some people have this vision that we could have this kind of robot wars version of future war where nations sort of send out their robot soldiers to battle each other and it all becomes completely bloodless. Um, I think that that's a pretty utopian vision. I think that more than likely we would find ourselves in a situation where these things are being deployed against human beings most of the time and causing significant pain, suffering and terror. Our next expert witness is Laura Nolan, a software engineer. Laura was employed at the technology company Google when in 2017 she was asked to work on a project with the U.S. Department of Defense. It was called Project Maven and involved developing artificial intelligence systems to analyze drone video footage. Military drones are controlled remotely. This wasn't a project to develop an autonomous weapon. But Laura was worried that she was part of artificial technology creeping into warfare and eventually resigned in protest. The experience stayed with Laura, and she became a campaigner, joining the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. Her objections are moral, but they're based in worries about technology. The basic problem, she says, is that computers and people think differently. Computers do reckoning, and people do judgment. So reckoning, anything that you can add up, spreadsheets, databases, definite concrete facts. These are reckoning, fixed algorithms, rules. Whereas judgment is anything where you might need to think about a fuzzy problem, a gray area. I think most of us, for example, if in a court of law, we probably wouldn't want to come across a robot judge that would apply the laws in a very fixed way because I think we realize that there's a lot of judgment, there's a lot of context, there's a lot of nuance in these kinds of questions. The problem is that the battlefield, especially ground combat in civilian areas, is a highly complex arena with lots of gray areas and unforeseen threats and complicated decisions, all of which require judgment. Software is it's very brittle if you start throwing situations that are not exactly the same as it was designed to deal with at it. it you know, things can get very unpredictable. Humans are very adaptable. They have judgment. This is an issue that we see in another area of autonomous technology driverless cars. They've done thousands and thousands and well, millions, many millions of hours now of testing on these cars probably. They keep running into problems or situations that are just slightly different to the ones that have been seen before in that extensive testing. Even in a relatively simple, predictable environment like road travel, self-driving cars struggle to deal with new scenarios. There have already been high profile issues. In America in 2018, a self-driving test car from the company Uber hit and killed a woman pushing a bicycle across a road. While an investigation found that the negligence of the human supervisor was mostly to blame, the car's systems failed to recognize the woman and her bicycle as a collision danger. Laura argues the problem is even more complicated for autonomous weapons. Because battle is such a complex situation, it's almost impossible to reliably test machines to judge their safety and reliability. The weather, what your opponent is wearing, whether there are civilians present, there's an almost infinite list of possible complications. In warfare, every situation is different. There are no rules and combatants are actively trying to subvert their opponents. They're trying to fool you, right? 
there's just so many variables. You would have to exhaustively test your, your weapon system, you know, not, not only once. You would have to test it exhaustively in every kind of situation that you might find it's in, in, in every kind of place. And that's just impossible. And Laura thinks this unpredictability raises a profound ethical problem, something called the accountability gap. The accountability gap is a problem that a lot of people think exists where in a situation where an autonomous weapon um, does something which would be a war crime if done by a human being, there could be nobody to blame. So in, in such a situation, can we blame the commander who deployed an autonomous weapon? Perhaps not. It could be that that weapon did something that was really surprising to that commander, something that was never in their training, something that even the engineers might not have expected. And can we blame the engineer? I think that's very difficult as well, because an engineer doesn't know all the situations that the weapon could be deployed in. But isn't the accountability problem a bit simplistic? I mean, can't we just blame the military which took a risk on using this weapon? I mean, they deployed it. They should have been aware of its potential risk, so aren't they responsible? I think, I think what you're doing here is you're making an argument for banning autonomous weapons. The behaviour of these weapons is going to be inherently unpredictable because of the impossibility of testing them in a representative set of scenarios. I think it is irresponsible to deploy these kinds of weapons and that's why I think they should be banned. Part 4. Killing in the name of. So can we talk about some of the nightmarish scenarios? Oh, I thought we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. It gets worse. <laughs> Paul Shari is director of the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. He fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and later became a policy analyst at the U.S. Pentagon working on autonomous weapons. He's written a book called Army of None, Autonomous Weapons in the Future of War. So does he think we're headed for a future where humans have given deadly decision making to robots? I think it's possible. Um, I certainly don't think it's in an inevitability. Um, I don't think we're there today. But the way the technology is progressing, it's certainly taking us down a path towards a point in the future where the technology will enable us to hand over decisions about life and death to machines. And I think that's a profound question for humanity. How would we actually arrive at that? We're moving already away from a world where humans are physically piloting drones just remotely, uh, sitting on the ground in cockpits and, and flying them with joysticks, to a world where humans are directing the drones where to go, with a keyboard and a mouse and programming and GPS coordinates, and then the drones fly themselves. None of these are contentious, um, but there are the kinds of incremental advances in greater autonomy um, that we're seeing you know, across the board in military robotic systems. But Paul worries that robots will never have the kind of intelligence necessary to understand the broader tactical and geopolitical risks of warfare. We've certainly had incidents where we have, you know, Russian and American warplanes flying near each other over Syria as both are supporting proxies on the ground. We've had Chinese and Indian military forces um, fighting at a low level in the Himalayas and skirmishes in the last year. Then introducing autonomous weapons into these kinds of militarized disputes presents a huge element of geopolitical risk. That if you had autonomous weapons, you know, shoot a valid military target, but in perhaps the wrong place and time, that could escalate a conflict. It could give a country a pretext to go to war if they wanted to, because ah, the other side shot first. Um, or it could ratchet up tensions in ways that are hard for national leaders to back down from, even if they wanted to. And there's another reason why the future of war might be so volatile. Paul points to how stock trading uses computers to make decisions to buy and sell at superhuman speed. And we've seen risks from that. Um, things like flash crashes, where the way that these algorithms interact in um, a really complex environment can create these unexpected and sudden movements in stock prices. And there's no ability for humans to intervene in machine interaction that's going on in milliseconds. 
The same thing could happen in war. We could see dueling machines firing at and responding to each other in the blink of an eye. Some Chinese scholars have referred to this idea as a battlefield singularity, a point in time at which the action on the battlefield eclipses humans' ability to respond. And it's a, indeed a very dangerous prospect to imagine because then when you ask, well, who's in control? The answer is really no one. But it could get even worse. The enemy might be able to turn your own weapons onto you. Oh, for sure. I mean, everything is hackable, right? And the military is not immune to this. They're using the same insecure computer infrastructure as everyone else. So I'm going to make an analogy again to self-driving cars. So it's possible to hack automobiles today. And it's been demonstrated that hackers have been able to disable the steering and brakes on a, on a car remotely. The big challenge and what's different is that if a hacker were able to gain control of them, the level of potentially destruction could be greater. Killer robots certainly raise a set of practical risks, but is there something more fundamental at stake? There's also a set of moral risks that come to bear, even if the machines maybe attack the right targets, valid enemy combatants in a lawful way. But if in doing so, we shift humans' relationship to war in a way that no person feels responsible for that killing. It's also worth asking that if no one slept uneasy afterwards, if no one had to bear the burden of combat from a moral standpoint, what would that say about us as a society? If we went to war and machines did the killing and afterwards no human felt morally responsible, what would that mean about our relationship to war but also to our own humanity? So, are killer robots the future of warfare? Well, autonomous weapons are already part of warfare today, so they will surely play a significant role. But how significant? The devil is in the detail here. What areas of warfare will we introduce autonomy into? Will we recognize the limits of technology, or can further innovation remove them? What degree of autonomy will we give machines, and what decisions are we comfortable letting them make? Because ultimately, robots will only have as much control as we decide to give them. This episode of The Inquiry was presented by me, Suzanne Kianpour. The producers were Nathan Gower and Viv Jones.